It's, this is the 49th talk in the collection, and this is entitled In the Dead of Night. And this was first published in Food for the Heart, and it was a talk given on a, a lunar observance night, Uposita Day, at Wat Pong, sometime in the late 60s. In the Dead of Night. Take a look at your fear. One day, as it was nearing nightfall, there was nothing else for it. If I tried to reason with myself, I'd never go. So I grabbed a pakao and just went. If it's time for it to die, then let it die. If my mind is going to be so stubborn and stupid, then let it die. That's what I thought to myself. Actually, in my heart, I didn't really want to go, but I forced myself to. When it comes to things like this, if you wait until everything's just right, you'll end up never going. When would you ever train yourself? So I just went. I'd never stayed in a charnel ground before. When I got there, words can't describe the way I felt. The Pakao, that's the Anagarika. The Pakao wanted to camp right next to me, but I wouldn't have it. I made him stay far away. Really, I wanted him to stay close, to keep me company, but I wouldn't have it. I made him move away, otherwise I'd have counted on him for support. If it's going to be so afraid, then let it die tonight. I was afraid, but I dared. It's not that I wasn't afraid, but I had courage. In the end, you have to die anyway. Well, just as it was getting dark, I had my chance. In they came, carrying a corpse. Just my luck. <laughs> I couldn't even feel my feet touch the ground. I wanted to get out of there so badly. They wanted me to do some funeral chants, but I would In a few minutes after they'd gone, I just walked back and found that they'd buried the corpse right next to my spot, making the bamboo used for carrying it into a bed for me to stay on. So, now, it was, now what was I supposed to do? It's not that the village was nearby, it was a good two or three kilometers away. Well, if I'm going to die, I'm going to die. If you've never dared to do it, you'll never know what it's like. It's really an experience. As it got darker and darker, I wondered where there was to run to in the middle of that charnel ground. Oh, let it die. One is born to this life only to die anyway. As soon as the sun sank, the night told me to get inside my glot. The... Um, large umbrella with, uh, equipped with a mosquito net. I didn't want to do any walking meditation, I only wanted to get into my net. Whenever I tried to walk towards the grave, it was as if something was pulling me back from behind to stop me from walking. It was as if my feelings of fear and courage were having a tug of war with me. But I did it. This is the way you must train yourself. When it was dark, I got into my mosquito net. It felt as if I had a seven-tiered wall all around me. Seeing my trusty arms bowl there beside me was like seeing an old friend. Even a bowl can be a friend sometimes. Its presence beside me was comforting. I had a bowl for a friend at least. I sat in my net watching over the body all night. I didn't lie down or even doze off. I just sat quietly. I couldn't be sleepy even if I wanted to. I was so scared. Yes, I was scared. And yet I did it. I sat through the night. Now... Who would have the guts to practice like this? Try it and see. When it comes to experiences like this, who would dare to go and stay in a charnel ground? If you don't actually do it, you don't get the results. You don't really practice. This time, I really practiced. When day broke, I felt, Oh, I've survived! I was so glad. I just wanted to have daytime, no night at all. I wanted to kill off the night and leave only daylight. I felt so good. I'd survived. I thought... Oh, there's nothing to it. It's just my own fear, that's all. <laughs> After arms round and eating the meal, I felt good. The sunshine came out, making, making me feel warm and cosy. I had a rest and walked a while. I thought, this evening I should have some good, quiet meditation, because I've already been through it all last night. There's probably nothing more to it. <laughs> then, later in the afternoon, wouldn't you know it, in comes another one, a big one this time. <laughs> the body on the first night had been a child. This was an adult. They brought the corpse in and cremated it right beside my spot, right in front of my glot. This was even worse than last night. Well, that's good, I thought. Bringing in this corpse to burn here is going to help my practice. But still, I wouldn't go and do any rites for them. I waited for them to leave first, before taking a look. Burning that body for me to sit and watch over all night, I can't tell you how it was. 
Words can't describe it. Nothing I could say could convey the fear I felt. In the dead of night, remember? The fire from the burning corpse flickered red and green, and the flames pattered softly. I wanted to do walking meditation in front of the body, but could hardly bring myself to do it. Eventually I got into my net. The stench from the burning flesh lingered all through the night. And this was before things really started to happen. <laughs> As the flames flickered softly, I turned my back on the fire. I forgot about sleep. I couldn't even think of it. My eyes were fixed rigid with fear. And there was nobody to turn to. There was only me. I had to rely on myself. I could think of nowhere to go. There was nowhere to run to in that pitch black night. Well, I'll sit and die here. I'm not moving from this spot. Here, talking of the ordinary mind, who would want to do this? Would it take you to such a situation? If you tried to reason it out, you'd never go. Who would want to do such a thing? If you didn't have strong faith in the teaching of the Buddha, you'd never do it. Now, about 10 p.m., I was sitting with my back to the fire. I don't know what it was, <laughs> but there came a sound of shuffling from the fire behind me. Had the coffin just collapsed? Or oh, maybe a dog was getting at the corpse. But no, it sounded more like a, a buffalo walking steadily around. Oh, <laughs> never mind. But then it started walking towards me, just like a person. It walked up behind me, the footsteps heavy, like a buffalo's, and yet not. The leaves crunched under the footsteps as it made its way round to the front. Well, I could only prepare for the worst. Where else was there to go? But it didn't really come up to me. It just circled around in front and then went off in the direction of the parkal. Then all was quiet. I don't know what it was. My fear made me think of many possibilities. <laughs> Must have been about half an hour later, I think, when the footsteps started coming back from the direction of the parkal, just like a person. It came right up to me, this time heading for me, as if it were to run me over. I closed my eyes and refused to open them. <laughs> I'll die with my eyes closed. It got closer and closer until it stopped dead in front of me and just stood stock still. I felt as if it were waving burnt hands back and forth in front of my closed eyes. Oh, this was really it. I threw out everything, forgot all about Buddho, Dhammo, Sangho. I forgot everything else. There was only the fear in me, stacked in, full to the brim. My thoughts couldn't go anywhere else. There was only fear. From the day I was born, I'd never experienced such fear. Buddho and Dhammo had disappeared. I don't know where. There was only fear welling up inside my chest, until it felt like a tightly stretched drum skin. Well, I'll just leave it as it is. There's nothing else to do. I sat as if I wasn't even touching the ground and simply noted what was going on. The fear was so great that it filled me, like a jar completely filled with water. If you pour water until the jar is completely full, and then pour some more, the jar will overflow. Likewise, the fear built up so much within me that it reached its peak and began to overflow. What am I so afraid of, anyway? A voice inside me asked. I'm afraid of death, another voice answered. Well then, where is this thing, death? Why all the panic? Look where death abides. Where is death? Why, death is within me. If death is within you, then where are you going to run to, to escape it? If you run away, you die. If you stay here, you die. Wherever you go, it goes with you, because death lies within you. There's nowhere you can run to. Whether you're afraid or not, you die, just the same. There's nowhere to escape death. As soon as I had this thought, my perception seemed to change right around. All the fear completely disappeared, as easily as turning over one's own hand. It was truly amazing. So much fear, and yet it could disappear, just like that. No fear arose in its place. Now my mind rose higher and higher until I felt as if I was up in the clouds. As soon as I conquered the fear, rain began to fall. I don't know what sort of rain it was. The wind was so strong. But I wasn't afraid of dying now. I wasn't afraid that the branches of the trees might come crashing down on me. I paid it no mind. The rain thundered down like a hot season torrent, really heavy. By the time the rain had stopped, everything was soaking wet. I sat unmoving. So what did I do next? 
soaking wet as I was. I cried. The tears flowed down my cheeks. I cried as I thought to myself, why am I sitting here like some sort of orphan or abandoned child, sitting, soaking in the rain, like a man who owns nothing, like an exile? And then I thought further. All those people sitting comfortably in their homes right now probably don't even suspect that there is a monk sitting, soaking in the rain all night like this. What's the point of it all? Thinking like this, I began to feel so thoroughly sorry for myself that the tears came gushing out. They're not good things anyway, these tears. Let them flow right on out until they're all gone. That was how I practiced. Now, I don't know how I can describe the things that followed. I sat and listened. After conquering my feelings, I just sat and watched as all manner of things arose in me. So many things that were possible to know, but impossible to describe. And I thought of the Buddha's words, Pachatang Vedita Bo Vinyuhi, the wise will know for themselves. I had endured such suffering and sat through the rain like this. Who was there to experience it with me? Only I could know what it was like. There was so much fear, and yet the fear disappeared. Who else could witness this? The people in their homes in the town couldn't know what it was like. Only I could see. It was a personal experience. Even if I were to tell others, they wouldn't really know. It was something for each individual to experience for himself. The more I contemplated this, the clearer it became. I became stronger and stronger. My conviction became firmer and firmer until daybreak. When I opened my eyes at dawn, everything was yellow. I'd been wanting to urinate during the night, but the feeling had eventually stopped. When I got up from my sitting in the morning, everywhere I looked was yellow just like the early morning sunlight on some days. When I went to urinate, there was blood in the urine. No. Hey, is my gut torn or something? I got a bit of a fright. Maybe it's really torn inside there. Well, so what? If it's torn, it's torn. Who's there to blame? A voice told me straight away. If it's torn, it's torn. If I die, I die. I was only sitting here. I wasn't doing any harm. If it's going to burst, let it burst, the voice said. My mind was as if arguing or fighting with itself. One voice would come from one side saying, Hey, this is dangerous. <laughs> Another voice would counter it, challenge it and overrule it. My urine was stained with blood. Hmm, where am I going to find medicine? I'm not going to bother with that stuff. A monk can't cut plants for medicine anyway. If I die, I die. So what? What else is there to do? If I die while practicing like this, then I'm ready. If I were to die doing something bad, that's not good. But to die practicing like this, I'm prepared. Don't follow your moods. Train yourself. The practice involves putting your very life at stake. You must have cried at least two or three times. That's right, that's the practice. If you're sleepy and want to lie down, then don't let it sleep. Make the sleepiness go away before you lie down. But look at you all. You don't know how to practice. Sometimes when you come back from arms round and you're contemplating the food before eating, you can't settle down. Your mind is like a mad dog. <laughs> the saliva flows. You're so hungry. Sometimes you may not even bother to contemplate. You just dig in. That's a disaster. <laughs> if the mind won't calm down and be patient, then just push your bowl away and don't eat. Train yourself. Drill yourself. That's practice. Don't just keep on following your mind. Push your bowl away. Get up and leave. Don't allow yourself to eat. If it really wants to eat so much and act so stubborn, then don't let it eat. The saliva will stop flowing. If the defilements know that they won't get anything to eat, they'll get scared. They won't dare bother you the next day. They'll be afraid they won't get anything to eat. Try it out if you don't believe me. People don't trust the practice. They don't really dare to do it. They're afraid they'll go hungry, afraid they'll die. If you don't try it out, you won't know what it's about. Most of us don't dare to do it. Don't dare to try it out. We're afraid. I've suffered for a long time over eating and the like, so I know what they're about. And that's only a minor thing as well. So this practice is not something that one can study easily. Consider, what is the most important thing of all? There's nothing else, just death. Death is the most important thing in the world. Consider, practice, inquire. If you don't have clothing, you won't die. If you don't have beetle nut to chew or cigarettes to smoke, you still won't die. But if you don't have rice or water, then you'll die. I see only these two things as being essential in this world. 
You need rice and water to nourish the body. So I wasn't interested in anything else, and as contented myself with what was offered. As long as I had rice and water, it was enough to practice with. I was content. Is that enough for you? All those other things are extras. Whether you get them or not, it doesn't matter. The only really important things are rice and water. If I live like this, can I survive? I asked myself. That's enough to get by on all right. I can probably get at least rice and arms round in just about any village, a mouthful from each house. Water is usually available. Just these two are enough. I didn't aim to be particularly rich. In regards to the practice, right and wrong are usually coexistent. You must dare to do it, dare to practice. If you've never been to a charnel ground, you should train yourself to go. If you can't go at night, then go during the day. Then train yourself to go later and later until you can go at dusk and stay there. Then you'll see the effects of the practice. Then you will understand. This mind has been deluded now for who knows how many lifetimes. Whatever we don't like or love, we want to avoid. We just indulge in our fears. And then we say we're practicing. This can't be called practice. If it's real practice, you'll even risk your life. If you've really made up your mind to practice, why would you take an interest in petty concerns? Now, I only got a little. You got a lot. You quarrelled with me, so I'm quarrelling with you. I had none of these thoughts because I wasn't looking for such things. Whatever others did was their business. When I went to other monasteries, I didn't get involved in such things. However high or low others practised, I wouldn't take any interest. I just looked after my own business. And so I dared to practise, and the practice gave rise to wisdom and insight. If your practice has really hit the spot, then you really practise. Day or night you practise. At night, when it's quiet, I'd sit in meditation, then come down to walk, alternating back and forth like this at least two or three times at night. Walk, then sit, then walk some more. I wasn't bored. I enjoyed it. Sometimes it would be raining softly, and I'd think of the times I used to work in the rice paddies. My pants would still be wet from the day before, but I'd have to get up before dawn and put them on again. Then I'd have to go down below that. Then I'd have to go down below the house to get the buffalo out of its pen. All I could see of the buffalo would, would be covered in buffalo shit. <laughs> then the buffalo's tail would swish around and spatter me with, what, with shit on top of all of that. My feet would be sore with athlete's foot and I'd be walking along thinking, why is life so miserable? And now here I was in walking meditation. What was a little bit of rain? Thinking like this, I encouraged myself in the practice. If the practice has entered the stream, then there's nothing to compare it with. There's no suffering like the suffering of a Dhamma cultivator, and there's no happiness like the happiness of one either. There's no zeal to compare with the zeal of the cultivator, and there's no laziness to compare with them either. Practitioners of the Dhamma are tops. That's why I say, if you really practice, it's a sight to see. But most of us just talk about practice without having done it or reached it. Our practice is like the man whose roof is leaking on one side, so he sleeps on the other side of the house. <laughs> when the sunshine comes in on that side, he rolls over to the other side, all the time thinking, when will I ever get a decent house like everybody else? If the whole roof leaks, then he just gets up and leaves. This is not the way to do things. But that's how most people are. This mind of ours, these defilements, if you follow them, they'll cause trouble. The more you follow them, the more the practice degenerates. With the real practice, sometimes you even amaze yourself with your zeal. Whether other people practice or not, don't take any interest. Simply do your own practice consistently. Whoever comes or goes, it doesn't matter. Just do the practice. You must look at yourself before it can be called practice. When you really practice, there are no conflicts in your mind. There's only Dhamma. Wherever you are still inept, wherever you are still lacking, that's where you must apply yourself. If you haven't yet cracked it, don't give up. Having finished with one thing, you get stuck on another. So, persist with it until you crack it. Don't let up. Don't be content until it's finished. Put all your attention on that point. While sitting, lying down or walking, watch right there. It's just like a farmer who hasn't yet finished his fields. Every year he plants rice, but this year he still hasn't managed to get it all finished. So his mind is stuck on that. He can't rest contented. His work is still unfinished. Even when he's with his friends, he can't relax. He's all the time nagged by his unfinished business. Or like a mother who leaves her baby upstairs in the house 
while she goes to feed the animals below. She's always got her baby in mind, lest it should fall from the house. Even though she may do other things, her baby is never far from her thoughts. It's the same with us for our, and our practice. We never forget it. Even though we may do other things, our practice is never far from our thoughts. It's constantly with us, day and night. It has to be like this if you're really going to make progress. In the beginning, you must rely on a teacher to instruct and advise you. When you understand, then practice. When the teacher has instructed you, follow the instructions. If you understand the practice, it's no longer necessary for the teacher to teach you. Just do the work yourselves. Whenever heedlessness or unwholesome qualities arise, know for yourself. Teach yourself. Do the practice yourself. The mind is the one who knows, the witness. The mind knows for itself if you're still very deluded or only a little deluded. Wherever you are still faulty, try to practice right at that point. Apply yourself to it. Practice is like that. It's almost like being crazy. Or you could even say that you are crazy. When you really practice, you're crazy. You flip. You have distorted perception and then you adjust your perception. If you don't adjust it, it's just going to be as troublesome, just as wretched as before. So, there's a lot of suffering in the practice, but if you don't know your own suffering, you won't understand the noble truth of suffering. To understand suffering, to kill it off, you first have to encounter it. If you want to shoot a bird, but you don't go out and find it, how will you ever shoot it? Suffering. Suffering. The Buddha taught about suffering. The suffering of birth, the suffering of old age. If you don't want to experience suffering, you won't see suffering. If you don't see suffering, you won't understand suffering. If you don't understand suffering, you won't be able to get rid of suffering. Now, people don't want to see suffering. They don't want to experience it. If they suffer here, they run over there. You see? They're simply dragging their suffering around with them. They never kill it. They don't contemplate or investigate it. If they feel suffering here, they run over there. If it arises there, they run back here. They try to run away from the suffering physically. As long as you're still ignorant, wherever you go, you'll find suffering. Even if you boarded an aeroplane to get away from it, it would board the plane with you. <laughs> if you dived under the water, it would dive in with you. Because suffering lies within us. But we don't know that. If it lies within us, where can we run to to escape it? People have suffering in one place, so they go somewhere else. When suffering arises there, they run off again. They think they're running away from suffering, but they're not. Suffering goes with them. They carry suffering around without knowing it. If we don't know the cause of suffering, then we can't know the cessation of suffering. There's no way we can escape it. You must look into this intently until you're beyond doubt. You must dare to practice. Don't shirk it, either in a group or alone. If others are lazy, it doesn't matter. Whoever does a lot of walking meditation, a lot of practice, I guarantee results. If you really practice consistently, whether others come or go or whatever, one rain's retreat is enough. Do it like I've been telling you here. Listen to the teacher's words. Don't quibble. Don't be stubborn. Whatever he tells you to do, go right ahead and do it. You needn't be timid about the practice. Knowledge will surely arise from it. Practice is also patibhada. What is patibhada? Practice evenly, consistently. Don't practice like old Reverend Pei. One rains retreat, he determined to stop talking. He stopped talking all right, but then he started writing notes. <laughs> Tomorrow, please toast me some rice. He wanted to eat toasted rice. He stopped talking, but ended up writing so many notes, he was even more scattered than before. <laughs> one, one minute he'd write one thing, the next another. What a farce. I don't know why he bothered determining not to talk. He didn't know what the practice was. Actually, our practice is to be content with little. Just to be natural. Don't worry whether you feel lazy or diligent. Don't even say, I'm diligent or I'm lazy. Most people practice only when they feel diligent. If they feel lazy, they don't bother. This is how people usually are. But monks shouldn't think like that. If you're diligent, you practice. When you're lazy, you still practice. Don't bother with other things. Cut them off. Throw them out. Train yourself. Practice consistently, whether day or night, this year, next year, whatever the time. Don't pay attention to thoughts of diligence or laziness. Don't worry whether it's hot or cold. Just do it. This is called Samma Patipada, right practice. 
Some people really apply themselves to the practice for six or seven days. Then, when they don't get the results they wanted, give it up and revert completely, indulging in chatter, socialising and whatever. Then they remember the practice and go at it for another six or seven days. Then they give it up again. It's like the way some people work. At first they throw themselves into it. Then, when they stop, they don't even bother to pick up their tools. They just walk off and leave them there. Later on, when the soil is all caked up, they remember their work and do a bit more, only to leave it again. Doing things this way, you'll never get a decent garden or paddy. Our practice is the same. If you think this patipada is unimportant, you won't get anywhere with the practice. Samma patipada is unquestionably important. Do it constantly. Don't listen to your moods. So what if your mood is good or not? The Buddha didn't bother with those things. He had experienced all the good things and bad things, the right things and wrong things. That was his practice. Taking only what you like and discarding whatever you don't like isn't practice. It's disaster. Wherever you go, you'll never be satisfied. Wherever you stay, there'll be suffering. Practicing like this is like the Brahmins making their sacrifices. Why do they do it? Because they want something in exchange. Some of us practice like this. Why do we practice? Because we seek rebirth, or another state of being. We want to attain something. If we don't get what we want, then we don't want to practice. Just like the Brahmins making their sacrifices, they do so because of desire. The Buddha didn't teach like that. The cultivation of the practice is for giving up, for letting go, for stopping, for uprooting. You don't do it for rebirth into any particular state. There was once a terror who had gone forth into the Mahanikai sect initially, but he found it not strict enough, so he took the Dhammayut ordination. Then he started practicing. Sometimes he'd fast for fifteen days. Then when he ate, he'd eat only leaves and grass. He thought that eating animals was bad karma, that it would be better to eat leaves and grass. After a while he thought, hmm, being a monk is not so good. It's inconvenient. It's hard to maintain my vegetarian practice as a monk. Maybe I'll disrobe and become a pakhao in Anagarika. <laughs> So he disrobed and became a pakhal, so that he could gather the leaves and grass for himself and dig for roots and yams. He carried on like that for a while, till in the end he didn't know what he should be doing. He gave it all up. He gave up being a monk, gave up being a pakhal, gave up everything. These days I don't know what he's doing. Maybe he's dead. I don't know. This is because he couldn't find anything to suit his mind. He didn't realize that he was simply following defilements. The defilements were leading him on, leading him on but he didn't know it. Did the Buddha disrobe and become a pakhao? How did the Buddha practice? What did he do? He didn't consider this. Did the Buddha go and eat leaves and grass like a cow? Sure, if you want to eat like that, go ahead, if that's all you can manage, but don't go around criticizing others. Whatever standard of practice you find suitable, then persevere with that. Don't gouge or carve too much, or you won't have a decent handle. Which literally means um, don't overdo it. <laughs> You'll be left with nothing, and in the end, just give up. Some people are like this. When it comes to walking meditation, they really go at it for 15 days or so. They don't even bother eating, just walk. Then when they finish, they just lie around and sleep. They don't bother considering carefully before they start to practice. In the end, nothing suits them. Being a monk doesn't suit them, being a pakha doesn't suit them. So, they end up with nothing. People like this don't know practice. They don't know... In they don't look into the reasons for practicing. Think about what you're practicing for. This teaching is taught for the sake of letting go, for giving up. The mind wants to love this person and hate that person. These things may arise, but don't take them to be real. So, what are we practicing for? Simply so that we can, we can give up these very things. Even if you attain peace, throw out the peace. If knowledge arises, throw out the knowledge. If you know, then you know. But if you take that knowing to be your own, then you think you know something. Then you think you're better than others. After a while, you can't live anywhere. Wherever you live, problems arise. If you practice wrongly, it's just as if you didn't practice at all. Practice according to your capacity. Do you sleep a lot? Then try going against the grain. Do you eat a lot? Then try eating less. Take as much practice as you need, using sila, samadhi and panya as your basis. Then throw in the dutanga practices also. 
These Dutanga practices are for digging into the defilements. You may find the basic practices still not enough to really uproot the defilements, so you have to incorporate the Dutanga practices as well. Now these Dutanga practices are really useful. Some people can't kill off their defilements with basic sila and samadhi. They have to bring in the Dutanga practices to help out. The Dutanga practices cut off many things. Living at the foot of a tree isn't against the precepts. But if you determine the Dutanga practice of living in a charnel ground, then don't do it. That's wrong. Try it out. What's it like to live in a charnel ground? Is it the same as living in a group? Sorry. But if you determine the Dutanga practice of living in a charnel ground and then don't do it, that's wrong. Try it out. What's it like to live in a charnel ground? Is it the same as living in a group? Dutanga. This translates as the practices which are hard to do. These are the practices of the noble ones. Whoever wants to be a noble one must use the Dutanga practices to cut the defilements. It's difficult to observe them and it's hard to find people with the commitment to practice them because they go against the grain. For instance, they say to limit your robes to the basic three robes, to maintain yourself on alms food, to eat only from the bowl, to eat only what you get on alms round. If anyone brings food to offer afterwards, you don't accept it. Keeping this last practice in central Thailand is easy. The food is quite adequate, because there they put a lot of food in your bowl. But when you come to the northeast here, this Tutanga takes on subtle nuances. <laughs> Here, you just get plain rice. In these parts, the tradition is to put only plain rice in the alms bowl. In central Thailand, they give rice and other foods also. But around these parts, you get only plain rice. This Tutanga practice becomes really ascetic. You eat only plain rice. Whatever is offered afterwards, you don't accept. Then there is eating once a day, at one sitting, from only one bowl. When you've finished eating, you get up from your seat and don't eat again that day. These are called Dutanga practices. Now, who will practice them? It's hard these days to find people with enough commitment to practice them because they are demanding. But that's why they are so beneficial. What people call practice these days is not really practice. If you really practice, it's no easy matter. Most people don't dare to really practice, don't dare to really go against the grain. They don't want to do anything which runs contrary to their feelings. People don't want to resist the defilements. They don't want to dig at them or get rid of them. In our practice, they say not to follow your own moods. Consider, for countless lifetimes already, we've been fooled into believing that the mind is our own. Actually, it isn't. It's just an imposter. It drags us into greed, drags us into aversion, drags us into delusion, drags us into theft, plunder, desire and hatred. These things aren't ours. Just ask yourself right now, do you want to be good? Everybody wants to be good. Now, doing all these things, is that good? There. People commit malicious acts, and yet they want to be good. That's why I say these things are tricksters. That's all they are. The Buddha didn't want us to follow the mind. He wanted us to train it. If it goes one way, then take cover another way. When it goes over there, take cover back here. To put it simply, whatever the mind wants, don't let it have it. It's as if we've been friends for years and years, but we finally reach a point where our ideas are no longer the same. We split up and go our separate ways. We no longer understand each other. In fact, we even argue. So we break up. That's right. Don't follow your own mind. Whoever follows his own mind follows its likes and desires and everything else. That person hasn't yet practiced at all. This is why I say that, that what people call practice is not really practice, it's disaster. If you don't stop and take a look, don't try the practice, you won't see, you won't attain the Dhamma. To put it straight, in our practice you have to commit your very life. It's not that it isn't difficult, this practice has to entail some suffering. Especially in the first year or two, there's a lot of suffering. The young, monk, the young monks and novices really have a hard time. I've had a lot of difficulties in the past, especially with food. What can you expect? Becoming a monk at 20 when you're just getting into your food and sleep? <laughs> Some days I'd sit alone and just dream of food. I'd want to eat bananas in syrup or papaya salad mm. and my saliva would start to run. 
This is part of the training. <laughs> All these things are not easy. This business of food and eating can lead one into a lot of bad common. Take someone who's just growing up, just getting into his food and sleep, and constrain him in these robes, and his feelings run amok. It's like damming up a flowing torrent. Sometimes the dam just breaks. If it survives, that's fine, but not if it just collapses. My meditation in the first year was nothing else, just food. I was so restless. Sometimes I would just sit there, and it was almost as if I was actually popping bananas into my mouth. <laughs> I could almost feel myself breaking the bananas into pieces and putting them in my mouth. And this is all part of the practice. So don't be afraid of it. We've all been deluded for countless lifetimes now, so coming to train ourselves to correct ourselves is no easy matter. But if it's difficult, it's worth doing. Why should we bother with easy things? Anybody can do the easy things. We should train ourselves to do that which is difficult. It must have been the same for the Buddha. If he just worried about his family and relatives, his wealth and his past sensual, sensual pleasures, he'd never have become the Buddha. These aren't trifling matters either. They're just what most people are looking for. So going forth at an early age and giving up these things is just like dying. And yet some people come up and say, Oh, it's easy for you, Lung Po. You never had a wife and children to worry about. So, it's easy for you. I say, don't get too close to me when you say that. Or you'll get a clout over the head. As if I didn't have a heart or something. When it comes to people, it's no trifling matter. It's what life is all about. So we Dhamma practitioners should earnestly get into the practice. Really dare to do it. Don't believe others. Just listen to the Buddha's teaching. Establish peace in your hearts. In time you'll understand. Practice, reflect, contemplate, and the fruits of the practice will be there. The cause and the result are proportional. Don't give in to your moods. In the beginning, even finding the right amount of sleep is difficult. You may determine to sleep a certain time, but can't manage it. You must train yourself. Whatever time you decide to get up, then get up as soon as it comes around. Sometimes you can do it, but sometimes, as soon as you awake, you say to yourself, get up, and the body won't budge. You may have to say to yourself, one, two, if I reach to the count of three and still don't get up, may I fall into hell. You have to teach yourself like this. When you get to three, you'll get up immediately. You'll be afraid of falling into hell. You must train yourself, and you can't dispense with the training. You must train yourself from all angles. Don't just lean on your teacher, your friends or the group all the time, or you'll never become wise. It's not necessary to hear so much instruction. Just hear the teaching once or twice, and then do it. The well-trained mind won't dare cause trouble, even in private. In the mind of the adept, there's no such thing as private or public. All noble ones have confidence in their own hearts. We should be like this. Some people become monks simply to find an easy life. Where does ease come from? What is its cause? All ease has to be preceded by suffering. In all things it's the same. You must work before you get rice. In all things you must first experience difficulty. Some people become monks in order to rest and take it easy. They say they just want to sit around and rest a while. If you don't study the books, do you expect to be able to read and write? It can't be done. This is why most people who have studied a lot and become monks never get anywhere. Their knowledge is of a different kind, on a different path. They don't train themselves. They don't look at their minds. They only stir up their minds with confusion, seeking things which are not conducive to calm and restraint. The knowledge of the Buddha is not worldly knowledge. It is supramundane knowledge of a different knowledge altogether. This is why whoever goes forth into the Buddhist monkhood must give up whatever level or status or position they've held previously. Even when a king goes forth, he must relinquish his previous status. He doesn't bring that worldly stuff into the monkhood with him to throw his weight around with. He doesn't bring his wealth, status, knowledge or power into the monkhood with him. The practice concerns giving up, letting go, uprooting, stopping. You must understand this in order to make the practice work. If you're sick and don't treat the illness with medicine, do you think the illness will cure itself? Wherever you are afraid, you should go. Wherever you are afraid, you should go. 
Wherever there's a cemetery or a charnel ground which is particularly fearsome, go there. Put on your robes, go there and contemplate Anichavata Sankara. Truly conditioned things cannot last. Do standing and walking meditation there. Look inward and see where your fear lies. It will be all too obvious. Understand the truth of all conditioned things. Stay there and watch until dusk falls and it gets darker and darker. Until you are even able to stay there all night. The Buddha said, whoever sees the Dhamma sees the Tathagata. Whoever sees the Tathagata sees Nibbāna. If we don't follow his example, how will we see the Dhamma? If we don't see the Dhamma, how will we know the Buddha? If we don't see the Buddha, how will we know the qualities of the Buddha? Only if we practice in the footsteps of the Buddha will we know what the Buddha taught is. Only if we practice in the footsteps of the Buddha will we know that what the Buddha taught is utterly certain, that the Buddha's teaching is the supreme truth.